Our New Testament lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and we're looking at the fifth chapter, verses 13 through 20. If you want to follow along, you can do so by going to page 1501. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this day. And it is true that we need you every hour, God. We ask that you would teach us your will. We ask that you would open our ears, our eyes, our hearts, and our minds. God, so that as we're at this time of Scripture being read and word proclaimed, God, that it would be your Spirit that would speak through my words so they wouldn't be my words but would be your words and that you would bring transformation in our lives so that we could glorify you. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, listen now to the word of the Lord from this Gospel of Matthew. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they might see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not even the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever participated in a fast? These words can be off-putting. They can cause us to to tune out or maybe be a little bit unsettled as maybe we've got some painful memories of fasts in the past. Fasting doesn't seem all that common, but in reality, you probably have done some fasting. Take a doctor, for example. You might be asked to do a blood draw, and so you have to fast the night before. Or maybe they ask you to do some intermittent fasting for some health reasons. Athletes fast from certain types of food so that they can perform better. And if you know a wrestler, you would know that they kind of do their own sort of fast so that they can get into that weight class that they're looking to compete in. Youth groups take part in the 30-hour famine, and the reason they do that is to promote awareness and raise money for children that are finding themselves with food insecurity around the world. It's getting closer to Lent, and many Christians in Lent go through different types of fasts. There are some that give up meat on Fridays, others that may say, I'm going to give up chocolate or maybe social media. With Lent right around the corner, I thought, hey, it goes along with this Isaiah passage, let's get a better understanding of fasting. The dictionary defines fasting as abstaining from all or some kinds of food or drink, especially as a religious observance. I appreciated that they had put that religious observance in there, although I do think that you could go beyond just food or drink in a fast. I started thinking as I'm looking at this passage of Isaiah, so what is the the word for fast, and it's this word sum. It appears just over 20 times or so in the Old Testament, and a few of the times are right in our Isaiah passage. 
Typically, the context for this word is directly connected to this idea of abstaining from food for some period of time. Now, what surprised me in all my research is I couldn't find a direct command connected with this word to the idea that we have to do fasting. Now, there are some times in the Old Testament where there are fasts that, that take place. Take Adam and Eve, for example, right? They're told not to eat the fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. So they're, they're in a way, fasting from that one object. As you look through the Old Testament, there's the, the kosher laws, right? Certain types of food that they can't eat or are supposed to be prepared in a certain way. And so that's another sort of fast from a, a set of food. Where I thought I would surely find a command connected to this word is around the Day of Atonement, right? This is a day that Jews commonly participate in a fast. But the word there is not so much. It's a, it's a different Hebrew word that connects to this idea of humbling one's self. This idea of also taking on Sabbath. And as I thought about this idea of Sabbath and, and where we've seen it throughout Scripture, my mind was drawn to the Israelites. Right? They're wandering through the desert. They've asked for manna. God is providing manna. And so they're collecting this manna to eat. But then they're told this rule, hey, on the sixth day, make sure that you gather enough manna so that you can eat the next day. And so Sabbath doesn't mean that we are limited from food. You could choose to do that, but it doesn't seem to be commanded here. And so my question is, well, why do people fast, or why did people fast if it wasn't commanded? I think the first important thing to to point out that I found in my research is that the Israelites didn't have the monopoly on fasting. Right? The ancient Near Eastern culture that they found themselves in was surrounded by people that would do fasting. And so it was part of the culture, typically connected to some sort of religious practice. But they did it for some very practical reasons. Here's four that um, got pointed out. Uh, stop a drought. right? Stop a military invasion. Exercise a demon or lessen a political or economical crisis that was happening in the land. Now, as I was looking at that word some and where it appears in the Old Testament, these are some of the things that it was related to. This idea of mourning, the idea of repentance as an aid for prayer, or this idea of a a kind of a corporate worship, all of them taking part in a fast together. These four things all are directly related to this idea of trusting God's providence, trusting in what God will provide for us and what God will do for us. And I believe that's what sets it apart from how some of the other ancient Near Eastern people were using it. Maybe some of these stories you might remember from our Old Testament. Take Esther, for example, right? She's the queen. And then she hears about this edict that's going out to the land that's going to put all the Jews' lives in danger. What does she ask the people to do? To fast and pray for her before she goes before the king to ask for his favor. Right? Take Nehemiah, for example. At the beginning of Nehemiah, where we're starting to hear his story, he learns about Jerusalem. He's deeply troubled, and he goes into this time of mourning and fasting for Jerusalem. And in turn, as he's kind of in this, he then goes to the king who sees that he's sad, and the king sends him on to Jerusalem. And so God uses the time to kind of transform and send Nehemiah out to help rebuild the walls. Another time that we see fasting is in Moses' life. Right when he goes up onto Mount Sinai to be with God, he spends a time of fasting there as he's trying to hear what God would have for the people. Maybe one of the most common instances of of fasting is found in our New Testament. And it points again to this idea of God's providence. Remember, Jesus at the beginning of his journey, much like Moses had fasted for 40 days, goes in this 40-day fast. And when he gets done with this fast, what happens right directly after that? 
Satan's there. And he goes through a series of different temptations. He says, hey, there's a stone here. I know you're hungry. Why don't you take this stone and turn it into bread? Well, what is Jesus' response? Man does not live on bread alone, but on the very word of God. Again, pointing to God's providence and trusting in God. So as we look back at the Israelites, as Isaiah is telling it, it looks like they're taking part in a a sort of common fast. And they're even saying, hey, we're doing this stuff, God. What's happening? Well, as we see God's response, we can see he was not really happy. They were not doing it in a way that was really honoring God. It was a lot about themselves. And that reminded me, you know, there's times where I've lived in that way too. And the story it reminded me of was when I was in middle school. I loved playing floor hockey in middle school. In fact, we played street hockey all the time. And so when I got to do floor hockey and I was getting to play with some of my friends, it was just awesome. Well, we were in the playoffs and we were matched up against this team that was just a little bit better than us. And we were down by a goal. And so there's middle school me sitting on the sideline. And I said some sort of prayer along the lines of, hey, God, if you can help us score a goal, I'm going to fast from Nintendo for a month. Well, we scored the goal. Although we ended up losing the game from the best recollection I can have is the other team ended up scoring a goal. And so after the, the game, I'm a little bit disappointed and I'm telling my mom about it and I tell her about this, this sort of deal I had made with God. And well, <laughs> let's just say I didn't play Nintendo for a month after that. Now, the reality is that my mom wanted to hold me to this and wanted to teach me a lesson that that's not really how this this works. You see, I was using God as a manipulative there. And in a way, that's what the Israelites were doing. And we really see this as we see God's response to them, right? In verse 5 of the Isaiah text are three rhetorical questions that he asks. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast day acceptable to the Lord? And so as we look at these questions, we start to understand more where their heart was in all of it and how they weren't really living out the the way that they should, right? So is it really an act of humility and humbling oneself if you're really doing it for your own gain? That doesn't seem like humility to me. Or what about this sackcloth and ashes and going through? That was a common thing to go along with, with fasting. Well, were they doing it as a performance? Or were they doing it with repentant hearts? They certainly had set aside a day for fasting, which is great, but what were they doing the rest of the week with the rest of the time that they they had? And so the reality is they they had messed up. Now, I don't think we should use this as a point to to point fingers and say, hey, you're so bad. I think we should use this as a time to learn from them because the reality is we mess up too. We don't live into the way that we're supposed to. And I know I'm talking about fasting here, but here's the reality. It could be all of worship that we could be talking about here, not just fasting. Are we going to be like the Israelites there and have it be about our desires and building up our kingdom? Or are we going to make it about God and God's kingdom? So God responds to them and says the type of fasting that he wants. And he doesn't say it's all about food. In fact, he says the fasting that I like is is some of the stuff that Ted pointed out in the children's sermon, the the sharing blood, the, the unloosening the ties. right? It's the fighting for those who can't fight for themselves. It's the spending time in prayer pleading that God would work in the injustices that we find ourselves around in in society, that God would bring about righteousness and justice. And it's when we're doing these sorts of things that we find ourselves in the right position before God, things that God would, would say is a good fast. We can't be like the Israelites whose practices weren't really lining up where it needed to be. They needed to check their heart. 
in our Matthew passage, Jesus talks about this kind of stuff that should be flowing out of our heart. He says that we should be the salt of the earth, right? We should be adding this flavor to the society that's around us. They should see something about what we're doing and be pointed to God. We should be the light of the world, that city on the top of the hill that's shining God's light out, reflecting God's love out to, to everyone. We get to verse 20 in our passage, and I, and I was just drawn to it as I was thinking of this text. You see, verse 20 says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so in first reading, if you're just kind of glancing through it, you might think, well, Jesus is trying to say, hey, you've got to live uh, in, a, in a righteous way and do more than the Pharisees did in, in accordance to the law so that you can enter the kingdom of heaven. And I don't think that's the interpretation that Jesus was hoping that we would get out of that. I think what he's trying to say is, hey, your righteousness can't exceed the Pharisees, right? You can't do enough acts and works to somehow gain this righteousness. No, where does righteousness come from for us? It's Christ's righteousness, right? He died for us on the cross for our forgiveness of sins. He rose again from the grave so that we could be raised too. And so it's when God sees Christ's righteousness in us that we're in the right place. And so I thought, well, how can we make sure that our worship, our fasting is, is focused on God and this relationship that God seems to be calling us to with God's people that he has created. Well, as the whole church, we've been given a great thing in our book of order called the, the Six Great Ends of the Church. And so I'm going to read them for you, and I think maybe as a church we'll spend some more time talking about it at a later time. I'll just briefly mention them this morning. The proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. Right? What was Ted saying last week about the message of the cross and that being the important focus? It's, it's right here. People need to hear about the cross and the salvation that's offered to them in the cross. The shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God. We need to be a place that's looking out for the children of God of all ages. So they can have a home here at the church so that they can be fed spiritually the maintenance of divine worship right? we need to make sure that our worship is focused on god and is not self-serving worship the preservation of the truth this happens when we continually point to the truth that's found in christ right he's the way the truth and the life and so we need to be pointing people to that truth and the truth of the gospel the promotion of social righteousness. We're able to live into this when our eyes are open, when we're noticing the orphans and widows in our society, when we're fighting on their behalf, when we're being the peacemakers out in our, the places God has, has put us. The exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. Every Sunday, we say the Lord's Prayer. There's a line in the Lord's Prayer. We say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? We need to be living into that prayer that we're praying every Sunday, hoping that as God transforms our life, that he will use us and transform society so that the society might be more like heaven, so that people might see that and be able to praise God in heaven. And so the great ends of the church are great for corporate worship, but what about us as individuals? How can we live into this right fasting? I think the place that it has to start is with our hearts. We've got to check our hearts like the Israelites weren't doing and making sure that we're doing things to honor God and not bring ourselves something out of it. I learned about this practice called feasting that was connected to fasting not so long ago. And I think this practice is one of the things that can help us with this idea, right? So in fasting, you're, you're giving up something. And what this feasting idea is that in place of that thing you're giving up, you're taking on something that will bring about some transformation, that's honoring God, that, that's going to bring about some growth in you. And so an example of this could be, right, maybe you give up lunch for a day. Well, instead of just giving up lunch and trying to fill it with a bunch of other things, 
you take that time and you say, okay, I'm going to spend this time praying. I'm going to pray for the world. I'm going to pray for missionaries. I'm going to pray for the government leaders. I'm going to pray for my friends. I'm going to pray for my family. I'm going to spend a time praying for other people, pleading on their behalf before God. Or maybe you decide, well, what might be easy for me is, is I'm going to spend less time on my phone. I'm going to spend less time on social media. Maybe I'll spend less time in front of the television. And so you take that idea of the fasting there and you say, okay, well, what am I going to do with this time? Well, you could use it as a time to, to dig into Scripture and read your Bible, or you could use it as a time to maybe pick up a book that could help you in your discipleship. And here's the great thing. The Christian Education Committee realizes that Lent's coming. And one of the things that we wanted to do for the church is give a book that people could read during Lent that would hopefully be some practical stuff about faith and living it out and discipleship and that sort of stuff. And we almost had it picked, but we don't quite have it picked yet. But we will do this thing on Wednesday nights. We're going to open it up for sort of a talk back. You can be reading and you can come in. You can share what you're learning. Questions can be asked. But maybe Wednesday night isn't going to be a good night for you. And here's the reality. If a bunch of people are reading this, you could get together with some friends in an informal way. Or maybe you could be doing something with your family around this book. The hope is that as we take on this idea of feasting, we could be feasting on, on reading this sort of book so that together as a church, we could be trying to grow in our faith. My hope for you as we move towards Lent is that this would be a time where you're spending time listening to God and what he wants to do in your life. My hope is that it would be about God's kingdom and not our kingdom that we could live into this idea of being the ambassadors out in society, that we could be the salt and the light for the places that God puts us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. But that is our prayer, right? That God would take our life, would bring about transformation in us so that other people could see God reflected through our actions and praise our Father in heaven. And so my, that's my hope for you. As you go out into the communities and the places where God has put you, that God's love would be poured into your heart and then would outflow so that others could come to know of that hope we have in the cross of Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you now and forevermore. The people of God said,